Hello. How are you, my fellow gardeners? It's good to see you today. Well, I'm not seeing, but yes. <laughs> so I want to thank you for being here. I know it takes a lot out of your time to be here each week and sometimes twice per week. Oh, hi, best yet. That's been a while, eh? But yeah, so thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. You're very welcome. So today we're going to be discussing cutworms because, you know, out of all the garden pests that we have, I think cutworms can be among some of the worst because their damage is usually irreversible. So we're going to be discussing a little bit about them, their life cycle and how you can protect your plants from them. So what are cutworms? Cutworms are actually the larvae of many different species of moths and they lay their eggs during the fall. So between September and October, they will lay their eggs. Some eggs will lay dormant for the winter. Some eggs hatch very early and then the worms will hibernate. Okay, so that sounds good. Okay, right. So these larvae, will stay in your soil and wait until when you provide them with your plants for them to feast on. Now, where do they live? Just a minute. Oh, hi, Anne White. <laughs> yes, yeah, so where do cutworms live? They live in the litter on the surface of your soil or in, in the soil because the soil will protect them from the sun, it will protect them from the weather, and it will protect them from predators as well. So they rather live in the soil. Oh, hi, Russell. Right, so how do cutworms feed? They like to attack the first part of your plants that they come in contact with, and usually this is the stem. So they will feed on the stem of your plants. And we're going to learn a little bit further on in the discussion how different types of cutworms feed. So the feeding habits of cutworms varies from species to species. Oh, hi, mom. Right, so their feeding pattern varies from species. So some will actually cut down the plants and then move on to the next plant, while others will cut down the plant and then feed on the plant that they have cut down. There are some that will feed on the foliage of your plants. Now, for those that feed on your fo the foliage of your plants, it's easier to find them. Their damage can be bad, but not as bad as those that cut your plants, especially the ones that cut and move on, because the ones that cut and feed spend the time to feed on what they cut. So all that plants, it's a waste for us, but it's not necessarily a waste for them because they're feeding on it. But for the ones that just cut and move down, they can do far more damage to your crop than those that cut and feed on what they are cutting down. So cutworms are a serious problem because usually if it, depending on the species of cutworms, once they attack your plants, it will die. If you can catch them early, like those that feed on the foliage of your plants, if you can catch them early, then you might be able to save your plants. 
but for those that cut down the plants there is no hope which is why they are so dangerous and that is why once we recognize that we have them we have to do our best to sort them out as quickly as possible oh hi melanie look what i got for you melanie i got your castings i'm just waiting until my husband's schedule is clear so i can go out because i don't go on the road when he's not here because someone has to be with the kids and i don't go on the road on weekends so yes it's ready so i will ship it to you as soon as i get the chance to okay so how can you identify cutworms as i said before cutworms come from various species of adult moths and so they will not all look the same so they usually are black tan they can be brown gray green yellowish some of them can be spotted some of them can be striped some of them can have spots and stripes so and these are not worms actually although they're called cutworms as we know they come from moths so they are caterpillars and not worms so caterpillars tend to have longitudinal stripes on them and they're usually about one to two inches long which is about two and a half to five centimeters in length now in some climatic condition they may overwinter as larvae or as pupae have you guys ever had cutworms? Have you ever had to deal with them? And what methods do you use to deal with your cutworms? I had to deal with them for the first time last year, and it was crazy. In fact, I've never really heard of them until last year. They, they created so much damage. All the beans and the peas that I planted last year, I wasn't able to harvest more than a handful of my broad beans everything else peas and beans was destroyed by the cutworms cabbages pretty much all the crop that i put out early was decimated by cutworms so it can be a bit of a challenge having to deal with them but that is why i'm having this discussion today because the more we know about them then the better able we are to protect ourselves from them so let's see melanie says she's never heard of them Oh, never had them, sorry. Yes, that's good. I hope you never have them, especially for those ones that cut the plants down. Right, so these cutworms, when you touch them, they tend to like to curl themselves up into a C shape. Some of them are actually host to parasites such as wasps, different types of wasps and flies. Now, do cutworms feed in winter? That depend also on the species. There are those that will remain as well. In the egg stage, they don't feed. Some of the eggs will hatch, depending on the species, in the fall or in the winter. Some of them will hatch after the winter has passed. So for those that hatch during the winter, they hibernate. So they don't necessarily feed. There are occasionally some that will feed in the winter, but they will feed on whatever plant like weed or whatever plant is there in the garden. I don't think I have seen them. Okay, yes. So um, further on in the discussion, I'm going to be identifying a few of the species of cutworms and how you can identify these individual species so you can look forward to that yes i think i've had quite a few it's not just one type that i had last year because when i dig around the plants to see what's eating the plant i find 
quite a few and they are not all looking the same. So I think I had quite a few species of them. Now, how can you know if you have cutworms in your garden? Your plants are usually cut in half or cut from the stem and they usually cut within the first inch, the two inch of your plants because whatever they come in contact with, that is what they will cut. Let's see, Bestia says, so I just found one in a pot yesterday and I did not know what it was, but I killed it. It was brown, brown reddish looking. Oh, okay, yes, it's good to get rid of them as soon as you see them. Right, so one, they will cut your plants close to the ground or they will feed on the foliage of your plants. Your plants will start to wilt in the sun if they have been affected by cutworms. So if you see your plants wilting, then you need to start checking why it is that your plants are wilting. Some cutworms may climb onto the plant so you need to look out for notches and holes in the foliage of your plants. And usually, unlike the case with some small insects that leaves tiny holes, they usually leave a reasonable size hole in your plant foliage. So you can be on the lookout for that. You may also see bare patch of land where you either have sown seeds or where you once had foliage. So if you find yourself with bare spot where you had seeds, then you need to investigate whether it is the case that the seeds did not germinate or if it is the case where it germinated but they were destroyed by cutworms. So I wonder if gypsy moths are cutworms. That's a good question. I don't know. I've never really heard of gypsy moths. I'm just going to jot that down so that I can see what they look like and to see if they are cutworms. Yeah, I've never heard of them, so I don't know. The list of cutworms are actually pretty extensive. And so I just select a few of them to discuss because it would take forever to actually go through the list of them. Right, so where was I? Yes, I was talking about how you can identify whether or not you have cutworms. Yeah, so when you see, if you plant your seeds and you see a lot of your seeds germinating, but then you have a bare spot, you need to find out if it is the case where the seeds did not germinate or if the plant germinated and they were destroyed by cutworms. Now, cutworms prefer to attack seedlings because they are, the stem is softer. So if you are starting your seeds indoors and you are able to hold on to your plants for a while before putting them outdoors, then it is a good idea to hold on to it so that the plant stem can harden a bit. Of course, there are some plants like lettuces and stuff that will not harden, but things like your tomatoes and your peppers and stuff, those can harden off indoors. So if you hold on to it as soon as, as much as possible, then that might help to reduce your damage. Sounds like they're every gardener's nightmare. They definitely are. And we are always anxious to get our garden started because we want to see things growing in our garden. So for some of us, myself, <laughs> we like to start planting the very day the gardening season begins. And these worms are always just waiting in the soil for you to put your crop out. So like I said before, it's a good idea to just wait a bit I'm going to be discussing some of the cutworms and the time that they're in their larval state because this can affect when you plant some of your crop. So for those of you who have long growing season, 
it's easier for you to recover when you have cutworms. But for people like me with a very short growing season, then when you get damaged by cutworms, it's pretty bad. And that is why it is always a good idea when you're starting seedlings to plant more seedlings than you actually need because if the worms damage, if the cutworms damage some of your crop, then you can always replace it with the ones that you have has spare. Okay, so what is the life cycle of cutworms? The amount of time that cutworms spend in their damaging state, which is the larval state, depends on the species of cutworms and it also depends on the temperatures that they are exposed to. So for the red buck cutworms, these are in their larval state between late April and early June. And I'm going to be telling you more about these red bark, uh, red bark cutworms later on, how to identify them and what part of the plants they usually attack. And I'm going to be doing that for the species that I'm going to be listing here, which is not a lot. There is also the dinghy cutworms and they are in their larval state from October to mid-July. So these ones are in the larval state for a very long time because they are ranging from October to mid-June. So they can do quite a bit of damage. Now, the pale western cutworms, these are in their larval state from late April to late June. So of the three species that I mentioned, the dinghy cutworms are the ones that are in the larval state for the longest. Now, as I mentioned before, the larval state of these pests is when they do damage or the most damage to our crops. So it's good to be on the lookout for them. Now, after cutworms have completed their larval state, they will burrow deeper down into the soil to complete their pupal state. Now, how can you get rid of or control cutworms? Once you have cutworms, it can be pretty difficult to get them under control. It's even more difficult to get rid of them. Most species of cutworms will have one generation per year, which is good because if we had a lot of generations, then it would be really devastating. So you can get rid of or control them by tilling your soil in the fall and in the spring. Now there are those of us who do not practice tilling the soil. We believe in a no dig garden. So if that is the method you use, then you'll have to find other alternative to control them. So by tilling the, the soil, you're exposing them to the sunlight, you're exposing them to predators and things like these. So that will help to reduce their population. It won't exterminate them all, but it will help to control the population. Now you can also put things like a straw, a toothpick, a fork or a nail in your garden or close to your plants. And you're gonna be putting these pretty close to your plants because what it will do is prevent the cutworms from wrapping themselves around your plants because they usually wrap themselves around the plants to feed. So by putting these objects close to your plants, then it will help to protect them from the cutworms. You can also put color around your plants. Just a minute. Okay. 
Right, so by putting color, by saying putting color around your plants, I have a container here where I am actually saving the toilet tissue roll. And I'm also saving the roll from my paper towels. So what you're going to be doing is put this around your plants. So you might have to cut it to get it to wrap around your plant and you might have to use a tape to hold it in place. Or you can just simply cut it and place it around the plant as is. You're going to make sure that you have inch and a half above the surface around the plant because that is the region in which the cutworms for those that feed on the stem of your plants that is the height that they usually affect your plants between anything up to inch and a half and then the rest of it you're going to be burying in the soil around the plants so you can use several items to create a color you can use the paper towel as i mentioned you can also cut a cup or a plastic bottle and use it the same way as you would with a paper towel make sure that you have it inch and a half out of the soil and the rest of it buried in the soil to protect the plant from the cutworms oh hi halal family homestead welcome to the live discussion Right, so you can get creative and use whatever you have available to put around your plants to protect it from the cutworms. And as I said before, sometimes you can, where possible, hold off on planting out your crop at the first chance that you have of planting. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so you can also use natural pesticides to control cutworms. Epsom salt, you can place this around your plants and this may deter them. It won't kill them, but it will deter them. You can use diluted hydrogen sulfide, sorry. <laughs> You can use diluted hydrogen peroxide to kill the cutworms because hydrogen peroxide will kill things like fungus knots, cutworms, parasitic nematodes, and more. So yes, you can use a solution of hydrogen peroxide to kill the cutworms. So the plants that are affected or the areas that are affected, you use the solution to feed your plants. You can also use Bt because this will also kill the cutworms. And further down in the discussion, I'm going to be discussing some natural things found around the home that you can also use to either kill or control these cutworms. So let's look more in depth at some of these cutworms and how you can identify these individually. The dinghy cutworms, these tend to be gray with light markings down their backs. And it usually look as if they're ha they have tire tracks on their backs. These do not cut your plants down, but they will damage the foliage of your plants. The red backed cutworms these have two reddish stripes along their backs and they may they may make holes or notches in the foliage of your plants the older <laughs> oh lord what to do with this brain of mine yes yeah, so the older larvae they will feed on the stem of the plants so that is the red bug. So they both feed on the stem and on the foliage of your plants. The pale western, these are the worst of them. They are, they have a light colored body, which is usually, and then, uh, so the body is light brown and then their head is dark brown. These like to dig tunnels 
and they will cut down your plants. So unlike the dinghy, which will feed on the foliage, the pale western will definitely cut your plants down. So you have to be on the lookout for them. So again, they have light color body and they have a dark brown head. Now the harmy yellowish cutworms, these have dark spots and on them they're brown and they will feed on your foliage, but they don't necessarily cut your plants down. The bristly cutworms, they have diamond shapes down their box and then they have two stripes parallel to the diamonds that are on their box. So that is how you will identify the bristly. Now for cutworms, they usually stay within the top four inches of the soil. They like to be in soil, they like to be in woody material. So if you use wood chips or if you have compost, these type of material they like to be in. And they usually like the upper layer because it tends to be drier than the lower region. So within the top four inches is where you will find them. Now to find these cutworms, you're going to remove within a square foot of a uh, square foot, you're going to take out all of the soil within a square foot, four inches deep and put it in a container. You can go through the container and see if you find any of the cutworms in there, then you will know that you're having an issue with cutworms. Or if you have a plant that has been cut by the worms, or if you have, if you see a plant wilting, or if you see large blotches or holes in your foliage, then around that plant, you just need to dig away pretty close to the plant, dig away the soil and search it carefully. You will find a cutworm if there is one there. Sometimes there might be more than one close to each other. So you should be on the lookout for them. Now, fields that have flowers during August and September are likely to have more cutworms in them than other fields that do not have flowering plant. I don't know why they prefer, maybe because the plants are producing late in the year, so they tend to have a larger amount of cutworms if you have flowering plant during August and September. Now it is said that coffee grounds can help to repel cutworms. Now, this is not scientifically proven, but it is believed and some people do use it to repel cutworms. Corn meal and bran meal can be used to kill cutworms. So whether you're using coffee grounds or you're using cut, um, corn meal or bran meal, you get half a teaspoon of whichever one you're using, put it around your plants. The worms will have to pass it in order to reach to your plants. But in the process of going towards your plant, they're going to stop and they're going to feed on the cornmeal or the bran meal. And what is going to happen is that it is going to swell in their stomach. They are not able to digest it just like the ants. And so it will result in them starving to death because they're going to feel full and so they're not going to be eaten because they feel full. As it swells, it will result in their death. So this is the information that I have on cutworms. I wanted to prepare a bit more for you, but it has been a pretty busy week for me. So I apologize for that. But I hope that the information that I provided was enough to help you to identify and treat cutworms if you ever have a problem with them. Okay, so if there is anything that you guys would like to talk about, feel free to do so.
I know it is a pretty busy time for most gardeners this time of year because some of us work away from home or from home and some of us while working we're still busy preparing our garden for planting some of us gardening season actually started already so they are able to plant outdoors i am not at that stage yet i have to wait quite a bit more unfortunately <laughs> because my garden season doesn't start until the last week in May. Although they say that there are some things that I can plant as soon as the soil is workable. You know, I went out in my garden today and I was, well, that wasn't today, that was yesterday. Uh, Melanie says, thanks for the info. It will be if they come visit him. Okay. Yes, you're welcome, my dear. Yes, yeah, so I went out in my garden um, yesterday. I was harvesting some snow from off the ground. And I was quite impressed. My garden for the raised beds, the high raised beds, they don't have any snow in them anymore. And I was actually able to dig down deep down about five inches, 10 inches in some raised beds. So I'm impressed with how quickly it's melting. It has been pretty warm, as I said before. We seem to be having a fake spring, but based on the forecast, I'm not sure if it is because we're supposed to be getting temperatures as high as 10 degrees, which is not the norm for this time of year. But whatever it is, the snow is melting pretty fast but I'm not going to be taking any chances and putting anything outdoors before the last frost date, unless it is something that can go out before, because I don't want my plants to be exposed to frost and then I lose them and I don't have the means to cover all of my garden to protect it from frost. Sometimes the frost that we get here in Saskatchewan is so bad that even if you covered it, the plant still won't survive. The early frost that we got in October last year, not October, that was uh, the first week in August, it was so bad. And remember, we don't usually get frost in August. And if we do, it would be at the end of August. We got this within the first week of August. It was so bad that some gardeners use thick blankets to cover their garden. Some move their their potted plants into their greenhouse or into their shed and the shed is not eaten, the greenhouse is not eaten, the plants, some of the plants still died. So the frost that we had last year, August, was a pretty bad one. Practically everything in my garden was destroyed. The only thing that survived that frost was the cool weather crops like my broccoli and kales, but everything else was destroyed. Thankfully, most of the things were harvested. My carrots were okay as well, so because they're under the ground, so they were okay, thankfully. But it was devastating, and I didn't even get the chance to cover them because I had just returned from a trip out of town, and I didn't even know that, well, I did know that it was going to be frosty that night, but I was so exhausted and so busy, I didn't even get the chance to cover it. But the people around me who got the chance to cover there were still lost a lot of their crops. So I don't know if it would have made much of a difference anyway. Yeah, so I'm actually pretty excited to see. Let's see, I am not at that stage either. Okay, yes. I just finished putting together a super handy, quiet wood chipper. Seems to be a very good machine. Think I will be able to process a half a yard of compost into worm bedding in two hours, maybe less. Wow, that's good. That's awesome. <laughs> that's very awesome. 
let's see melanie says in august i will still be planting potatoes oh oh yes you're in you're in toronto so you can so you can plant um you have a longer growing season than we do but that's nice you're able to be planting potatoes in august everything that i have to plant apart from like the leafy lettuce has to be planted by the end of june and if you start if you plant at the end of june your crop is going to be very late you want to have everything in by the middle of june if not you may not be able to harvest anything so we have a very short window in which we can plant because remember the 24th of may is our last frost date here in saskatchewan and then if you don't have everything in by the middle of june chances are you won't be able to harvest everything the only way you'll be able to harvest all of your produce is if you are starting from seedlings and not from seeds and if you're starting from seedlings you want to make sure that your seedlings are not on the smaller side but on the larger side yes yeah, so we're not able to plant anything in august i don't even think you would end up getting any of the leafy greens like your lettuce and your um spinach because those are what grows the fastest yes we don't you know, i tried last year to grow some lettuce like after i harvested some and i started some i think that was either late july or early august they did germinate but they didn't make it past two inches so yes let's see melanie says that's really sharp yes we only have a three week three week window if we're starting from seeds and depending on what it is too because if you're planting things like onions from seeds then you definitely cannot be planting them in may and june you have to be starting them like now so i have my onions started i wish i had some more I have a lot of the sweet onions the spanish white sweet onions but the cooking onions because i don't cook the sweet onions but the Pattison onions that i like i don't really have a lot it i don't know people hardly eat I don't know if I should say people hard to eat, but I would assume that every household uses more of the cooking onions than the sweet onions. But yet still, when you buy a sachet of onion seeds, if you buy the cooking onions, you get a small amount of seeds in the sachet. And if you buy the sweet onions, you get at least five times that amount in the sachet. So I don't know if maybe because they know people are using more of the onions that you use to cook so they put a small amount so that you can buy more sachet for the same price i don't know what their strategy is but yes yeah, so i wish i had more of those and i don't really want to go to a garden center to buy any seeds i don't leave my yard if i don't have to so and then if i buy them online because i usually buy from one of the local suppliers here but if i buy them online i'm gonna have to pay for um handling and pack and shipping and to buy just one pack of seeds and pay a minimum of ten dollars just to have it ship is not worth it let's see i am so excited for the worm castings can't wait to use it my first time using it okay i'll try to get it to you as soon as possible <laughs> and then you can take part in the challenge for yourself so that you can compare it with the compost and see which one works best i'm still i still haven't been away from home yet so i haven't started a challenge because i still need to go and get that potting mix yeah and i don't really have soil in my backyard that i can dig up and sterilize to use to start i want something that is light and loose yeah 
Okay. I think I've read that already. Okay. Right. So anyway, um, if you guys have anything else that you want to discuss, feel free to do so. And if not, then I'm going to say good evening. So I'll just wait a little bit. Right, so um, last, where am I keep, where do I keep saying, um, yes, yeah, so last week, I said that I would be doing a, on Friday, I would be doing a, what is it called, a demonstrative worm farm live, so I got my replacement light, my ring light, I'm not very satisfied, but I think I'm going to be keeping it because I returned the first one I got because the section that holds your camera is scratchy as if it is used. Um, I sent that back and I got another one. This one doesn't look as badly damaged, but it is still has a lot of scratches on it. So I think maybe it has, a, it has to do with... Um, Handling, maybe the way they handle it when it's being manufactured or being packaged. So I think I'm just going to keep this one. I'm going to complain anyway. Not that it will do much good, but anyway. Oh, hi, health or healthy home. Yeah, so as I was saying now, um, um, again, <laughs> I'm going to be doing that demonstrative worm live for you. So if you know of anyone who is interested in starting a worm farm and the things like that, then you can tell them about the live so that they can be a part of it. I wanted to, this brain of mine, is there anybody out there with any good brain that would like to swap with me? Yeah, so um, I want to do a demonstrative live for, because I wanted to do a workshop for the worm farming, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that because of the pandemic. I can't really have people around me. I don't, it's not necessarily the, necessary. The government has lifted some of the restriction last week, so we are able to have 10, 10 people around us at any given time, but I'm still not going to go that route. I'd rather play it safe. So I can't do the workshop, but I'll be doing a demonstrative live. So there'll be quite a lot of information to share. Some of you already have worm farm. Some of you are new to worm farming, or you might be contemplating worm farming, or maybe you just simply like to hear about worm farming. So. That is what we're going to be focusing on for this Friday's Q&A Live. Of course, we can discuss other things as well, but we're going to be focusing mostly on the demonstration. And Melanie says, cleaning my basement apartment for the new tenants and realized the window has full most of the day, so I will be moving past there. Okay, I guess you meant full sun. But that's pretty good. I um, Last year, I started my seedlings in the basement. The lighting, first of all, I don't have a south-facing window. And the lighting in there was not very good. When I grow things like my um, aloe vera on it or my, I had a sage on my windowsill last year in the basement, those did okay, especially the aloe vera. But my seedlings they weren't happy at all they weren't happy at all they were very pathetic and then i didn't really have a lot of grow lights so i had a little tent the same greenhouse that i have set up in the garage now i had that in the basement and i was using a few grow lights to start off my seedlings but that didn't do so well i did have things like tomatoes and stuff from it, but they grow very slowly because the size of the light was not appropriate. But 
I moved this year. I am using the spare bedroom to grow my plants, and they're doing, they're doing, they're not too bad. In the colder part of the weather, it was terrible because when I brought my plants in from outdoors last fall, most of them eventually died because they didn't have enough light. But since the weather started to warm up in the last two weeks, the thing, the plants that are in that spare room is actually doing a whole lot better. I even moved my peppers and put them on that on that top shelf so that they can get the light from the window as opposed to using the grow lights. And the peppers are doing pretty well. So yeah, they get the west light, sunlight from the west. So they're not doing too badly. I noticed some of them, like my um, ginger, seem to be a bit leggy. Well, I don't even know if it is leggy, but the leaves are taking long to open up. So it's putting out the leaves, but it is taking long to open up. So, yes, but they're not doing too badly. So we'll see how that goes. So pretty soon I'm going to be setting up the light in my greenhouse in the garage and see how that works. I'm hoping that the lights that I got are actually good ones. I have them use, uh, well, I've been using one of them uh, in my spare room for my seedlings because I started a few. I started my tomatoes and my peppers on Saturday. So I have one of the grow lights going now. So I will see how that go, how that work out. Um, yes, yeah, so I have to build a stand though in the, in the greenhouse in the garage for the grow lights because I want to make the stand so that when I put the grow lights in there, as the plants grow, I can quite easily just move them up to the next level without having to be creating something different each time the plants grow. So that is another project that I'm gonna have to be working on in the next week or so. Yes, I'm still not sure how the plants are going to out there when i go outside because it is cold outside when i go in the garage it feels as if it is very warm but i'm not sure but i have it at 80 degrees fahrenheit i don't know what that is in celsius i have it at 80 degrees i know that 70 is 21 so it should be warm enough but because of where it is in the garage it might not be but yeah I'm going to be having some fun this year with growing. But I think I might be overdoing it a bit. I think I'm planting a little bit too much of stuff because I don't have enough grow lights to feed or to supply them with lights. But anyway, that is it. So guys, um, I'm thankful that you are all able to join me for this discussion. Next week, we are going to be doing another, next week, Monday, another gardening live. And we are going to be looking at two different type of garden pests. But as for what type they are just yet, I am not sure because I haven't prepared that material just yet. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking part in the live. Okay, you're welcome, Mom. Have a good evening. <laughs> yes, so you can look forward to that. So I hope you guys have a good evening. And I'm going to go and feed my hungry tummy. Okay, take care, Russell, and take care, Melanie, and all of you who are on the live. 